So why don't we go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone. This is Marcia Hart, Executive Director of the Coos History Museum and your host for this evening's special edition Tuesday talk. Our subject tonight is Inequity, a Summary of Discrimination in Oregon and the South Coast. We've brought together to, for you today four panelists who will present a very brief uh, summary of significant historical events which have shaped the inequity in our state and in our community. Each panelist will make a brief presentation followed by a Q&A. At the end of the program, we'll list some references materials for anyone wanting to do their own research and some which are available in our online museum store. Uh, I would like to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel uh, within the next day. I also want to acknowledge our sponsors of our Tuesday talks, and that is Al Pierce Company and the Mill Casino, who have generously supported our museum first Tuesday talks when we were open and now our virtual version that we're presenting today. Um, so before we start and uh, present our first uh, speakers, I wanted to give you a few tips that will help you have a better webinar experience. Uh, first, we recommend that you close all of your other programs on your computer and any websites you might have open. We understand this will help with your bandwidth and might uh, be able to have you see a better picture and have a better audio. Uh, we also are in webinar mode, so you'll only see our panelists and the slide presentation that we have today, tonight. Each panelist will have about 10 to 12 minute presentation and at the end of the program we'll have a Q&A uh, period. So how you can, you can submit a question to the panel is there at the bottom of your screen is a uh, selection that of a, open a Q&A box. When you open the Q&A box, you can then type in your question. If you see a question that you, uh, you agree with or you want to know more about, there is a button that you can uh, vote on it or like the button. And what that will do is it will promote the question to the top of the list. So as we're reviewing those questions, we can make sure that those that have the most votes that we answer, make sure we answer those at the end of the session. Uh, we also have a chat option where you can share information with the panelists and everyone in the group. Um, we ask that if we don't put questions in that, uh, in the chat box, just if you could use the Q&A box for questions, that would be helpful. Uh, Ariel, um, Ariel is our education coordinator here at the museum and she will be monitoring the questions and then submitting them to the panel at the end of the Q&A. Uh, Ariel, do you have anything else that you might add uh, to help people out? Um, the only thing I would suggest, uh, again, if you wave your mouse around and you hover over the bottom of the screen, that's where you'll see the chat and Q&A option. I much just that if you have questions specifically for the panelists, put it in the Q&A. If you open the chat though, um, you can talk to everybody else, all the attendees. You just have to make sure you select all attendees and panelists, not just the panelists on the bottom of the chat box. And then you guys can also have discussions amongst yourselves and ask each other questions, let each other know where you're from. Um, so yeah, that's about it. So we've had over a hundred people uh, register for the event and right now we have 79 joining us. So welcome everyone. Um, and so with that, I wanna finally uh, uh, welcome and introduce our panelists. Uh, tonight, we have Patty Witt Phillips, who is the historian for the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. We have Taylor Stewart from the Oregon Remembrance Project. We have John Littlefield, who's a local historian, a uh, volunteer here at the museum, and also an author. Also, Steve Breif, who is, again, a, another uh, history teacher from North Bend, a local historian, author, and is a member of our Coos County Historical Society's Board of Directors. So to get started, those of us who are not going to be talking are going to be turning off our videos, and then we'll get started with Patty. And so, Patty, what can you tell us about the Indian experience? Well, um, we've been living along the Oregon coast for thousands of years. Um, things were you know, just ordinary everyday life, trade, sometimes conflicts, um, but things started to get uh, pretty interesting sometime in the 18th century with the accidental introduction of diseases, the influx of colonists that completely changed the native world upside down. Um, 
So I kind of wanted to open with a John F. Kennedy quote. He once said, for a subject reworked so often in novels, motion pictures and television, American Indians remain probably the least understood and most misunderstood Americans of us all. And I think that was as true uh, when he said it as it is today. Um, Indian people are often not and never have been particularly well understood, which is in a way kind of ironic since we were the, the first people of this land. Uh, so next slide. Uh, one of the things a lot of people still to this day are not aware of is that tribes are not only uh, cultural groups or ethnic groups, but also political entities and tribal governments have relationships with the uh, federal government and many tribes also have ratified treaties which help shape some of the legal aspects um, of that relationship. Um, so next tribe, uh, next slide. So this is a map of Western Oregon. It shows a lot of different tribes, uh, a lot of different languages. Um, so this is what things looked like shortly before um, colonists came. And of course, we all know Western Oregon is a pretty hilly country, lots of rivers. Um, pretty much, as they used to say, every, every river had its own tribe, but the tribes were not isolated, as some people think. Uh, there was a lot of travel between the different bands, and a lot of trade uh, between the different bands. And in fact, uh, from Coos Bay, where the Hanas and Millic people are, we called the Columbia River country Mahlouche, and occasionally people would even go as far as Mahlouche, the Columbia, um, to trade. So we can go to the next slide. So the earliest contacts were probably indirect. Um, probably even before the, well, the 1500s, there might have been some Spanish and British ships sailing by, certainly in the 16 and 1700s. Again, ships passing past the coastline, um, the occasional rumored shipwreck, uh, but there wasn't much interaction. They didn't usually come near a shore for trade. In the 1790s, that began to change, at least with the south coast of Oregon, and some ships did begin coming close enough that the coastal tribes would row out in their own canoes and try to trade because the tribes were very fascinated with these strange ships, and they were very eager to initiate trade. Uh, at the dawn of the 1800s, you do get some fur trappers coming through. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company was the most active in Southern Oregon. They had established a fort along the Columbia River and parties would come down, um, especially into the Umpqua country, but also out to Coos Bay and Coquille and Rogue River eventually and uh, trade. And Hudson's Bay was chartered in Great Britain um, so they actually, in their relationships with the tribes, did tell the tribes, you know, hey, the Britons are the good guys, the Americans are the bad guys. That might have been one of the factors of why when Jedediah Smith's American party came up in 1828, um, he had a lot of conflicts with the tribes. Some of it was the Smith party's own behavior. There's a lot of different stories about that, but uh, certainly Hudson Bay for years telling people about Americans are the bad guys did not help. Now, the Indian people didn't mind the trade so much, although one thing uh, did happen that did frighten the tribes very badly is the spread of um, diseases. Um, the fur trappers inadvertently introduced a lot of illnesses, smallpox, tuberculosis, measles, even influenza could be fatal. And as different waves of various epidemics went through, it would kill more and more people until entire villages were wiped out. And this left behind shell-shocked survivors. Um, I strongly suspect, you know, in today's terms, a lot of them would have been diagnosed with PTSD because you can only imagine what it would be like to survive an event where you saw every person you ever knew, your whole extended family, die, and there was no one left in your village. And so then, uh, by 1850, when uh, settlers who were interested in establishing longer-term residence and the fur trappers were in southern Oregon, um, the tribes were in a pretty bad state. Um, so many people had already died. Um, the survivors were not a good position then to try and fight back. And uh, the, the, some of the early settlers were miners and the miners 
were pretty violent. Uh, they desperately wanted to just make money and make it now, and the tribes were in the way. Um, they also had a pretty horrible tendency to attack Indian women. None of these things endeared them uh, to the local tribes. So conflict soon broke out, and indeed a group of miners attacked um, a Nasoma or Coquille village in January of 1854. Um, at this time, um, many in the federal government wanted to try and get the Indians away from the settlers. And in part to do that, they needed to negotiate treaties with the tribes, establish reserves for the Indians and uh, remove the Indians away from the settlers. So in 1855, Joel Palmer was desperately trying to establish a treaty. He negotiated a treaty with most of the Oregon Coast bands that year. Uh, but as we all know, it failed because 1855 is also when the Rogue River Wars began in Southern Oregon. Um, now the Coos Bay and Lorumqua people had not joined in the war, but people were afraid that they would. So in 1856, um, the Coos Bay people were rounded up were actually first held at the point where Bay Point Landing is today, and then from there were removed to Fort Umpqua, which was a hastily built fort on the north bank of the Umpqua River in the dunes. And they and the Lower Umquas were held there for about four years. Now, as you can see on this map on the left, some of the other Southern Oregon tribes uh, were removed to the Siletz Agency, where the town of Siletz is today. Um, so like some of the um, Curry County people and Upper Coquille people were removed by boat. Uh, so if you read uh, Athabask Athabascan Witness, a book about Coquille Thompson, um, a Coquille man who had a very long life, he remembers being on the boat as a child and the people were very afraid that they were going to be thrown off from the boat and killed. But of course, luckily they, they weren't. Uh, other tribes were forced to do a land march along the coastline and you can see the picture on the right is an artist's rendition of the removal of Chief John and uh, the Rogue River people up the coast. And you can see Meeposh there, Humbug Mountain in the background. And then, uh, well, let's go to the next slide, if we can. So in 1855, by presidential executive order, they had created the Coast Reservation, which initially was rather large. It went from Salmon River in the north down to the Silt Coos River and extended from coastline to about 20 miles inland. And this was where all Western Oregon tribes originally were supposed to go. Everybody, you know, Clatsop or Kalapuya or Checo, everyone was supposed to go there eventually. So the, the Coos Bays and the Lorumquas were held at Fort Umpqua. And so in 1860, they were moved from there up to Yahats, which was then labeled the LC sub agency of the Coast Indian Reservation. Um, the Sayusla people were not removed um, because going down to Silk Coos River, it encompassed their country, so they, they stayed. A lot of Coquille people were removed to Siletz, um, along with several other bands from Curry County. And uh, conditions on the reserve were pretty hard. There, for most of them, there wasn't enough food because with the exception of a handful of bands, there were no ratified treaties. So there were no financial, you know, reserves made um, to get people food or adequate food. Um, so they tended to be pretty hungry. Out at Yahats, they were trying to get people to grow potatoes, which some years did okay, some years not, peas, carrots, but also wheat, which is really bizarre because Yahats is not wheat farming country in terms of climate at all. You may as well try and grow, you know, pineapples in Anchorage. It's just kind of a, a mad idea, but uh, nevertheless, they were trying to do that for a few years. So because conditions were poor and uh, people were still dying in terrible numbers from diseases, um, they would run away from the reserve. Well, it was technically considered illegal for an Indian to be off reservation without written permission of the agent. Uh, so they would send out soldiers on sweeps at time to capture runaways and take them back to the reserve where they were beaten in public to try and get the other people to like, don't you run away, this will happen to you. The only Indians usually allowed off reservation were Indian women married to white men. And even in those cases at times, um, the Indian wives were taken away although in most cases, uh, the white husbands would not permit their wives to be removed. I only know of a case or two where a woman got pulled away from her husband and children 
um, to be forced to live at Yahats. So we go to the next slide. So the reservation period, at least for Kusla, Rumpkwa, Seusla people and some other South Coast Indians came to an end around 1875 uh, because a lot of settlers were interested in, well, more land and the coast reservation was large. So the government began removing bits and pieces of it to open it up to settlement and thus the Indian lands were shrinking. Um, the LC sub agency had been talked about as being one of those parcels to be open to white settlement. There was a meeting held in 1875 with representatives of the LC, Sayusla, Loramqua, and Coos Bay headmen. And all the headmen spoke against the reserve, that portion of the reserve being closed because they said, well, you know, we were promised to have a home. We've already been removed at least once and we don't want to move again. These speeches were written down. They were transmitted back uh, to Washington, D.C. And of course, they were completely ignored and the reservation was closed down anyway. And thus, the Indians living at Yahats were made homeless. Um, all the surviving LCs at that point were living at Waldport and they hung on there um, at least until the 1880s. Um, they'd even gained a certain measure of acceptance from area settlers because a lot of the LCs living at Waldport were day laborers that worked for white people up there. So it got to the point where most settlers in Waldport were okay with leaving the Alces in Waldport since they were day laborers, but eventually they did move to Salets. A lot of Coos, Lorum, Quonsa, people were disgusted and just refused to move to Salets because they no longer trusted any promises from the government because they remembered that 1855 treaty and its unfulfilled promises. So a lot of Coos Bay and Lorumqua people um, went to live on the North Fork Sayusla River, such as the family pictured here on the left is Jeff and Jane Harney. They were Hanus people who had roots going back to some Empire North Bend villages. And then on the right is their daughter, uh, Martha, and her white husband, Alex. And descendants of that family still live to this day on the old family allotment on North Fork Sayusla. Other people who left went back uh, to the Lorumqua River and a lot came back to Coos Bay, uh, where my relatives were. Uh, and in fact, there were so many Indians and half-breeds, as they used to be called back in the day, living up there. Uh, South Slough was some, sometimes called Rascal Creek. Um, now, in this post-reservation period, um, the Indians were struggling to survive because, of course, a lot of their old homelands were occupied and they were no longer allowed to live there. Um, women with white husbands usually had a, a place to live because their, their husbands could get uh, land grants. And then eventually Indian people themselves were able to get their own land allotments. And many did along the Umpqua River and um, up South Slough. Although many Indians eventually lost those lands because they didn't have the money to hang on to them. Um, and a lot of the people were making their living working in logging, fishing, and canneries. So if we go to the next slide. So even though many decades had passed, the Indian people still had never forgotten about the Treaty of 1855 and the fact that money they'd been promised for their land they had to give up had never ever appeared. Um, so tribal people began having meetings. Um, they really gained a lot of steam in the 19 teens. They'd get together, have feasts and talk about the treaty. Problem is nobody knew where the treaty was, what had happened to it, um, even what it said exactly. Um, so they got together and passed a collection plate and had some money and sent a representative of the tribe, a man named George Bundy Wasson, back to Washington, D.C. And he took a lot of trips back there in the 20s. Uh, he eventually found the treaty in archives back there and lobbied Congress because to sue the U.S. government, apparently you have to have permission to do so, from, granted by Congress. So they got that. Um, they were gonna use the treaty and the elders um, to testify at a land claims trial. So their land claims trial was held in 1931 and a lot of people, a lot of Indian people went to testify and a few surviving elderly pioneers also testified on behalf of the Indians and basically it was about establishing where the different tribes lived um, and where the boundaries were. And in this picture here on the, on the left seated is Frank Drew. He spoke Hanus fluently. He also spoke Sayuslamqua fluently and he often worked as a translator for his friend who's standing up there, uh, James Buchanan, 
And James Buchanan's an interesting fellow. He was a boy when the treaty was signed. So he was there and saw it being signed. Um, he didn't speak English too well, apparently. So he often had other people such as Frank Drew translate for him at um, various meetings and also here at the land claims trial. Now, unfortunately, things did not turn out well and had some long-term consequences for the tribes. Uh, it took several years, but in 1938, the court issued its decision. And um, they said, in essence, that the tribes could not prove their claims because most, most of the people who had testified had a direct financial stake in the outcome, so they threw out their testimony. They hadn't hired any outside experts, you know, someone with a PhD uh, to declare, yes, these are the Indians that lived at this particular place. So they lost the trial, and this would have some pretty bad consequences about 20 years later. So if we go to the next slide. So in the 20th century, um, Uncle Sam's Indian policy was evolving. Basically, you could say they wanted to get out of the Indian business. Um, if there are no Indian governments, um, then there are no, no more trust obligations, treaty obligations, or government to government relationship with tribes when there are no tribes. So this idea of tribal termination um, started being talked about in the 40s and gained a lot of traction in the 1950s under the Eisenhower administration. Um, the man in the picture here, Howard Barrett Sr. was a Sayus law man and he was the tribal chairman in the 40s and the 50s. And it was a very stressful time for him because it comes immediately on the heels of losing the land claims trial. But, you know, the tribes are still working with the government and still trying to get something. And instead, what they get mostly is a fight against tribal termination because the government really wanted to get rid of all the Western Oregon tribes and Klamath. And eventually they wanted to unrecognize all the tribes in North America. But the plan was to do it in stages. Uh, some of the tribes in Oregon and elsewhere actually thought termination was going to be a good thing because they didn't like... Um, all the control the federal government had over themselves or their resources, and they thought it would mean more uh, control for themselves. Like they would ha have a lot more flexibility to do what they needed to do. Um, our tribe didn't have anything pretty much other than tribal halls, a meeting place. And uh, same with the, the Coquilles, you know, nobody had anything uh, except this one meeting area. Um, so they were very much opposed to termination. Uh, but our tribal representatives were often not allowed in meetings, were not allowed to vote in meetings. And so when a termination bill was finally passed in 1956, in spite of very vigorous opposition from our tribes, uh, we were listed on it along with every other single band in Western Oregon and the Klamath uh, Indian tribe, Klamath Indian Reservation in uh, South Central Oregon. And uh, there's a quote here I wanted to share real, real quick about termination. I love it. Uh, Terminationist members of Congress acted in the best interests of their non-Indian constituents. Timber, water rights, oil, and other natural resources were at stake on Indian reservations. U.S. Indian treaties would become meaningless with the removal of trust status. In essence, the revocation of federal government's responsibility to protect Indian rights under treaty agreements made Indian property holders vulnerable to opportunists. And that is exactly what happened uh, for tribes that did have some lands, um, most of them very swiftly lost it all after termination went through. So then our tribes had a new fight on its hands. Seems like we're always fighting somehow um, to get termination reversed. And for years, this did not look very promising, but um, other tribes in the US have been terminated, such as the Menominee in Wisconsin, and they regained recognition, I think it was 1974. So that gave, everyone else a lot of hope that, hey, hey, the Menominee did it, we can too. Um, so a lot of tribes were lobbying Congress in the 70s to get re-recognized. Um, the first in Oregon to have success on that front was, was Siletz, Confederate tribe Siletz in 77. Um, then I think it was 1982, Grand Ronde. Uh, 1983, I believe, was Cow Creek, uh, Umpqua. And then uh, we had success with our bill in 1984, Klamath in 86, and Coquille in 1989. Um, so by now, well, you never know when it'll change again, but for the time being, um, termination as a policy has been repudiated, and I really hope it won't come back. 
But it, it's been a long, strange journey for the tribes. I mean, this, this place is our homeland. Then we weren't wanted in our own homeland and essentially had to fight to stay there. But it's been a fight, even though it was a long and arduous one, turned out to be worth fighting. Tsutsiwas, that Thank is you. that. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Uh, next, we have Taylor Stewart uh, with the Oregon Remembers Project. Stewart. Hi, as Marcia said, I'm Taylor Stewart. I graduated from the University of Portland in 2018, and currently I'm in a Master's of Social Work program at Portland State. And I've been working with the Equal Justice Initiative in the Coos History Museum for about the last year and a half on an effort to memorialize the history of lynching and to memorialize Oregon's only recorded victim of lynching, Alonzo Tucker. I'm excited to be here with you this evening because I've, as I've said before, I believe this to be an important conversation. Right now we're living in the midst of history. The Black Lives Matter movement has forced our communities to re-engage with the question of whether America has truly lived up to its promise of equal justice for all. We have begun to take a more serious look at the issue of systemic racial injustice, both in the present day and in the past. Personally, I feel that in order for us to get to the future we want, we have to reconcile with the past to better inform our present. And so in order to get to that better future, we can no longer ignore what has come before. Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative says that truth and reconciliation are sequential. And so in order to get to that reconciliation and to that better future, we have to engage in some truth telling. And that's what we're doing tonight. We are engaging in truth telling about Oregon's troubled history with race. A troubled history that began even before we became a state. Oregon has a long entrenched deep relationship with anti-Black racism. And that started when Oregon was a territory when they passed three different Black exclusionary laws. The first was when Oregon outlawed slavery. It gave slaveholders two years to remove their male slaves and three years to remove their female slaves. At that point, the free Blacks had to leave Oregon. Otherwise, they would be subject to lashing. It was called Peter Burnett's Lash Law, and the law stated that the lashings had to be no less than 22 times, but no more than 39 times. Peter Burnett is quoted himself as saying, the object is to keep clear that most troublesome class of population, Blacks. We are in a new world under the most favorable circumstances, and we wish to avoid most of those evils that have so much afflicted the United States and other countries. And so again, Oregon passed a law stating that it shall be unlawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside in Oregon. At least one known person was actually expelled from Oregon under this law. He was a business owner and his name was Jacob Vanderpool and he was forced to leave Oregon when a competing white business owner reported him to authorities. And then finally, when Oregon became a state, it included in its Bill of Rights a clause that prohibited blacks from being in the state owning property and making contracts. Thus, Oregon was the first state to enter into the union with black exclusionary laws, essentially making it a whites only state. And that language would not be removed from the Oregon state constitution until 1926. And so it was only natural that in this white utopia, Oregon would come to have the largest Ku Klux Klan west of Mississippi. Furthermore, in 1922, Oregon elected a man by the name of Walter Pierce to the seat of governor, who was a supporter of the Ku Klux Klan, and he would go on to represent Oregon in the U.S. House of Representatives between 1932 to 1942. Fast forward a little bit, and it wouldn't be until the latter half of the 20th century that Oregon finally ratified two Reconstruction Era amendments. Originally, Oregon was one of only six states that refused to ratify the 15th Amendment, the amendment that gave Blacks the right to vote, and they would only ratify that amendment when they celebrated their centennial celebration in 1959. But despite ratifying the 15th Amendment, it would be another 14 years before Oregon ratified the 14th Amendment in 1973. The 14th Amendment gave Blacks equal protection under the law, 
and they would only ratify that amendment when Oregon's first black state legislator, William McCoy, felt that it was a priority, that while symbolic, it was important that Oregon's state constitution reflect the fact that black Oregonians had equal protection under the law. And so Oregon would continue this relationship with anti-black racism well into the contemporary 80s and 90s, when Oregon had the largest skinhead movement in the country, where their goal was to reclaim Oregon as a white homeland. And so it is no surprise that a lynching occurred here in Oregon. The same anti-black racism that fueled the lynching era existed here as well. We, as Oregonians, are a part of the legacy of lynching. And these racial terror lynchings, largely tolerated by state and federal officials, represented some of the most brutal violence, humiliation, and barbarity in American history. This era of racial terrorism profoundly impacted race relations in the United States and helped shape the geographic, economic, and social conditions of African Americans in ways that are still felt today. Lynching and racial violence fueled the exodus of millions of Black people from the South into urban ghettos in the North and the West during the first half of the 20th century and created a social environment where racial subordination and segregation was maintained with limited resistance for decades. And so the Black refugees who fled the South lived in marginalizing and disadvantaged circumstances in the urban Northwest and Midwest, while the Black people who remained in the South faced continued threat, terror, and humiliation rigidly maintained through legalized racial segregation. And so the violence and terror of lynching created a legacy of racial inequality that has not yet been adequately addressed in America and continues to sustain racial injustice and bias to this day. And so this is just kind of a snapshot of the kind of history that we as a nation and we as Oregonians must confront. I believe we would live in a different society if we properly acknowledge this history and took seriously its role in our present day society. And so this is what we are trying to do with the Alonzo Tucker Memorial. How does this history affect us in the present day? That is the question we grappled with at the Soil Collection, and that is the question we will continue to grapple with whenever we eventually place a physical memorial. Because if there is systemic racism in Oregon's past, there is certainly systemic racism in Oregon's present. Because I don't believe you can point to a time in our history and say, that's when we ended systemic racism. And so we have to talk about the systemic racism that is still in our communities today. Because those are the kinds of conversations that we want to spawn with this Alonzo Tucker Memorial. Those are the kinds of conversations that make our communities better. And so what does racial violence look like today? And does our Black community feel supported? Because I can tell you that the Black community of 1902 was not supported. I can tell you that the widely publicized lynching of Alonzo Tucker had an effect on every single Black person that was residing in Oregon at that time, in the same way that George Floyd's killing has had an effect on Black Americans today. There was no justice for Alonzo Tucker, and there was no justice for the Black community of 1902. So the question is, how does the white community of today support the black community in a way that never happened in 1902? Because I believe the history, the burden of history compels that. And so we engage in this truth telling tonight for the purpose of being changed by history but that change is a process and only through undergoing that process can we then find reconciliation. Thank you. I'll pass the floor to John. Hi, I'm John Littlefield. I'm uh, retired and I'm interested in history. So 
before we move to my topic, which is Chinese people, Chinese immigrants in Coos County, I want to follow up on what was just said with a little bit of history about Marshfield that is well known. Marshfield had a segregated school about 110 years ago. Um, after the infamous lynching or murder of Alonzo Tucker, about half of the African Americans in Marshfield left town, but some of them stayed on. And in the fall of 1903, a year later, a Mrs. Trollinger, who was an African-American mother, applied to the school superintendent to allow her children to attend Marshfield schools. The school superintendent was Franklin Golden, after whom Golden Field is named. Mr. Golden uh, had been in several kinds of businesses, but he was uh, an educator. He was from West Virginia. He had spent his early career in New Orleans. The mayor of Marshfield at the time was an outspoken, perhaps I should say unreserved racist from Virginia. And so Mr. Golden told Mrs. Trollinger that her children could not come to school. He would take it up with the school board. Three of our prominent citizens of Marshfield at the time constituting the school board followed his recommendations and passed a resolution that says, and I want to read this to you, it's from the school records of Marshfield uh, School District. On account of the physical condition of said Negro children, that was the reference then, and their uh, lack of cleanliness, their presence in the white classes will materially retard the progress of the 330 white children now in attendance. And so the school board in its wisdom set up a private school on Front Street the room had to be rented by the school teacher and she was the lowest paid person in the district. She wasn't as paid as much as the janitors. This didn't work out very well. And in 1907, Mrs. Trollinger was back, wanting her children entered into school. And the Coos Bay Harbor wrote this story. At the same time that the Negro children wanted into school, two other children of mixed blood between the Chinese and the whites, and the Indians and the whites also sought schooling. These threats, as they were called, which, consi which uh, consi were considered embarrassing circumstances and which tinged the peaceful school day routine with unpleasantness, those are quotes, made it into some of the local newspapers and promptly made it back onto the agenda of the school board. One newspaper observed that Quote, the matter is assuming more serious proportion each day, helped materially by the fact that there are some few Orientals of school age in the city. What to do in a community where, as one newspaper put it, quote, the citizens are known to be en masse against the mixing of the races. So that apparently was the situation in Marshfield and perhaps North Bend in about 1907. Now I want to move to the Chinese immigrants here. Uh, the story is probably well known to you about how Chinese immigrants came to the western part of the United States. Word of the gold rush in the discovery of gold in California reached the Canton area of China almost as quickly as it reached the eastern seaboard. And conditions in China were such poverty, overcrowding, lack of jobs, that many young Chinese men left as soon as they could, came to California looking to, to become rich at what they call Gold Mountain and planned to return to China. So they are referred to as sojourners. They never intended to stay. They never intended to come to the United States as permanent immigrants. Within a few decades uh, during the Civil War, the Transcontinental Railroad was being constructed ads were placed in California to get men to work on it. The work was so hard and arduous that no one applied much. And so one of the uh, big four of the railroad group, uh, Mr. Crocker, told uh, Congress uh, that they needed some Chinese workers. And so they imported 15,000 to 20,000 Chinese men, again from the Canton area, to work on the railroad. There was opposition in Congress to this, but Leland Stanford, who was one of the railroad owners and also the governor of California, uh, told Congress that they would be unable to meet the deadlines for the construction of the western part of the Transcontinental Railroad unless the Chinese were allowed to work on it. 
So they came to America to work hard and hard they did work. Uh, they were paid 30 to 50% less than white workers. They had to pay for their own food. Conditions were so bad they went on strike and then conditions improved. Um, after those two events, the gold rush and the railroad, uh, working conditions in California deteriorated. There was a great deal of discrimination and, and outrage in California over the presence of Chinese men, for the most part men. And uh, so many of the Chinese left to seek their fortunes elsewhere on the West Coast. And some of them came up to Southern Coos County, probably in the 1850s, around 1854, when gold was actually discovered uh, southeast of Powers on Johnson Mountain. And there is a record in one Peterson and Powers book that the Chinese miners there, placer miners, were spooked by the early white settlers and driven out of the area, leaving us today with just some names like China Flat, China Creek, China Joe Creek, which are all in that area. Um, the Chinese who came to Coos County might have numbered in the hundreds. We'll never know because the censuses every 10 years miss them. The Chinese did not interact with federal and state law enforcement. And uh, many of the Chinese workers were here just seasonally. Remember that they came from Canton area, which is a low marshy riverine ocean front place. So the skills that they had included earth moving, cooking, laundry, menial skills, um, and, uh, and railroad building. They also were very, very talented and skilled at uh, gutting and flaying fish. And we had fish. So in Gold Beach, the Hume factory brought crews of Chinese up seasonally to work in the cannery at Wedderburn. Uh, he employed exclusively Chinese workers. There is a newspaper article in 1884 that says 90 Chinese men were at Parkersburg, about three miles up Coquille River from Bandon, at a time when there were only about 200 people in Bandon. So approximately a third of the population of that part of the lower Coquille were Chinese men working at a fish uh, processing plant at Parkersburg. They would return to San Francisco after the fishing season, so they didn't live here permanently. Um, now the picture, could you go back, Steve? I'm yeah. sorry. I moved a little bit. Uh, some of the uh, Chinamen, as they were referred to, that's a pejorative term that's like calling a black person a boy, but Chinamen is how they referred to themselves and that's what they were called then. Uh, in the background here, you can see a Chinese camp cook. This picture is interesting to me. It's at the museum. All of the men are, uh, are named in the picture. They even have their horse, but the Chinese man is nameless. Um, the Simpsons had two Chinese cooks at uh, Shore Acres, and we have pictures of them and their names. So these sojourners were here briefly and then left. It was a revolving situation. The, um, now you can flip to the next one. Some of them, Marshfield set up laundry businesses. We'll come back to that in a moment. When they were competing with white employers, things got done. The, this is a cartoon that was in the Coos Bay Times, Forerunner of the World, in 1910. And it is a, a paid advertisement by a man, a white man, who had a laundry competing with the Chinese laundries. It shows um, a, China, a Chinese man smoking opium at noon for his dinner and then spitting on the clothes in the afternoon when he's pressing them. That ran in the paper several times. Um, next picture, please. Beginning in 1882, the United States enacted legislation against Chinese immigration, trying to keep Chinese laborers out of the country. 
uh, this had started during the Grant administration earlier, but in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And uh, this cartoon is representative of that. Uh, the, the act is 1882, actually, not 1880. Um, it was to be 10 years long, and it was renewed every 10 years until it became permanent under the Theodore Roosevelt administration in 1902. It barred the entry of Chinese labors. It was the only United States law directed at a specific ethnic group. There were a few limited exceptions for officials, students, and merchants, merchants loosely defined. And so sometimes the Chinese merchants in the United States, in Oregon, in Marshfield and North Bend, formed companies so that they could bring in other men as their partners, as merchants. And sometimes these partners stayed a brief while and then moved on. So there was a loophole. Um, Oregon also had exclusion laws for Chinese. The Oregon Constitution, in addition to what um, we've, Taylor Stewart already told you about African Amer Americans, the Oregon Constitution said that no Chinaman should own, could own property in the state. Uh, they, there was a provision against interracial marriage and they prohibited Chinese people from voting. In 1923, at the height of the Klan presence in Oregon, Oregon passed an act modeled on a California law that restricted land ownership and property rights by limiting leases to short term and barring companies from uh, uh, being owned by in ineligible aliens. There was also legislation that I found interesting at a federal level uh, where if a woman married an alien, she would lose her citizenship that was the Immigration Act of 1907 under the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Now, since interracial marriage was prohibited with Chinese, that would mean that a, a Chinese woman born in the United States and a citizen of the United States, if she chose to marry a Chinese man who was an alien, she would lose her citizenship. Hmm. The Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed only in 1943 when nationalist China was our ally in World War II and after Madame Chiang Kai-shek came to the United States, she spoke perfect English, having been educated at Wellesley, she spoke to a joint session of Congress and the law was finally repealed. Next photo, please. Marshfield had a very, very small Chinatown, so to speak. And if you look carefully at this portion of a photograph from 1910, you'll see a three on it. And that three encompasses a block uh, basically between, let me see, Market and Highland and Second and Third, about where the DEQ office is now at Oregon Veterinary. To the left, you'll see the O'Connell building still standing. And in the background, number five is the Chandler Hotel. And if you look way over on the left, you'll see a one and you'll see about a three or four story. There's a little thing flying around there. That is the Gawai building. I will come back to that. That building was constructed part of it as early as the 1860s. It was one of the oldest buildings in Marshfield. Gawai added onto it and doubled the size of it. Um, so there is the Chinatown of, of Marshfield in 1910, but Chinese people lived in other parts of the city as well. Uh, next. Um, the Chinese people of the first generation, the sojourners and the merchants, uh, kept to themselves, but they interacted with the locals. They lived in segregated places, and they died in segregated places. The Chinese had their own cemetery. Its exact location is a little fuzzy, but it was to the west of Park Street and Highland Street on the south slope of what we call Telegraph Hill or Signal Hill or Knob Hill. It has all those names in our history. The cemetery is no longer there. Um, the Chinese had, had a tradition, have a tradition of retrieving the bones of the deceased and shipping them back to China. And that was done even in Marshfield. There were three retrievals that are known to me. And our earliest Chinese merchant 
who is photographed and recorded, a man named Guy Fee, died in 1906 and the Coos Bay Times uh, ran an article in 1913 when a bone retrieval crew came, trained people who retrieved his bones, boxed them up and out they went on the Redondo, which was one of our wooden sailing, uh, one, one of our wooden steamships here. Um, these two men are the principal merchants of Chinese origin in the Coos Bay region. The man seated to the right in the picture is Gao Wai. His real name was Chan Gao Wai, the Chinese last name usually placed first. And the man to the left standing is Chan Jing Hing. Both Chans were from the same village in the Canton Guangdong province of China they were not, I'm told, closely related, but they knew each other, uh, both merchants in neighboring towns. The next photo shows the Galway family in Marshfield. It's a very interesting photo. The family sent it to me from California. Uh, it's 1913, it's a Staden photo, and it shows the family in tra transition the men, and the boys and the men, Gao Wai is seated with his baby daughter, they're all dressed in Western garb. The women, that is Mrs. Gao Wai and the baby May, are in traditional Chinese dress. Now, before we leave, I just want to say that all of these children, they had seven children, all of them were born probably in the Gao Wai building, all of them were probably uh, birthed with the assistance of Dr. Horsfall that you've heard of. He signed birth certificates for Bert Y, who is the boy in the middle, the tallest child with the, the little hat on. Bert Y stayed in our area. He married Bessie, a Chinese bride of 16 that, he, he, that his father arranged for him in San Francisco, brought her back on the breakwater to uh, North Bend, and they ran the Bert Y or Bert's Cash Grocery in North and into the 1960s. And there are children and grandchildren of them still living, some living in our area. Most of the Chinese, because they wanted to marry, they couldn't intermarry with whites for quite a while, and they might have chosen to marry their own kind, so to speak, uh, had to go to California to find a larger Chinese community uh, where they made their living. So many of our uh, Chinese families of the 1910s, 1920s, and 30s left the area. That's true of the Jing Hing family. They had six children in North Bend. All six children of the North Bend family went through the North Bend schools, were very popular. The, uh, that family's uh, six children had an orchestra that was so good that it played at all the school dances around the state and even on the radio. Gawai's family, these children that you see here, the little boy on the left went on to Stanford University, married the private secretary of Madame Chiang Kai-shek and was in the cloak and dagger era of China during the transition of the World War II and the communist takeover. And then he worked for the CIA, assisting us uh, there. Bert, the tall child, stayed in North Bend. And Roy, the little boy there, uh, went on to be an inventor and worked for the uh, uh, military. The other children that are not yet born in this picture became a lawyer. Uh, Moon Chan became a lawyer and uh, his sister uh, was good enough in music to be uh, accepted to the uh, Oberlin School of Music. Uh, the boy in the middle of this picture is Moon Chan, the boy with the, the young man with the glasses. And I chose this picture out of the Mahiskan, which is the Marshfield High School Annual, because it suggests to me that Moonshan was, as they said, very popular, uh, head of his class. Uh, he got the Americanization Award in the eighth grade for being exemplary of the most Americanized person <laughs> in the class. Um, and the last picture is Bessie Y. Bessie Y is Bert Y's wife. This is the 16 year old bride from San Francisco that he brought back on the ship. She ran the uh, cash grocery all her life. Her children and grandchildren are in our area. She was mother of the year in North Bend in 1954. So I wanna close my remarks by saying that the 
the Chinese presence here was limited. The results were mixed. They met with terrible and great discrimination at the beginning, but many of them assimilated uh, through our educational system, were accepted, and went on to very successful lives. Whether assimilation is a good thing or not, whether that is in fact a form of racism in itself because one culture assimilates and dominates the other, I'll leave to you to think about. But I don't want to leave you with the idea that they were, as a group, all discriminated against. Uh, my own parents played tennis with the Chan children. That's why I became interested in it, because I heard a, a, a lot about how good they were as students. And um, they had a lot of respect here. Hello. So I'm Steve Greif. I'm a former North Bend High School history teacher and a member of the board of uh, the board here at the museum and written a couple books myself. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ku Klux Klan. Not the Ku Klux Klan we see in this picture. This cartoon is the reconstruction post-Civil War era Klan. When the war was over, uh, the Confederate whites that had lost power did their darndest to remain in power by subjugating the freed blacks. And there are a number of groups, among them the Ku Klux Klan, that, quote, tried to keep the Negro in his place. We all know this. We all know the segregation, the Jim Crow laws that followed, uh, keeping blacks separate from whites uh, throughout the South. Um, pretty much uh, in that era, uh, the Klan was a violent organization, and its violence led to um, its kind of its undoing. Um, eventually, it, it faded away and became very, very small and almost lost to history. So um, why are we going to talk about the Klan um, in Coos County, especially when we see this diagram, which shows us population statistics in Coos County? In the 1880s and early 1900s, uh, Indians, Blacks, Chinese, and uh, Japanese folks were all considered colored by the United States uh, Census Bureau. And if you look at the uh, number of colored compared to the total population in the county, um, you'll see it's a very small percent. As John and others have suggested, it was probably a huge undercount. There's probably way more uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, and Native American that were undercounted at this time. But um, we do have pictures. Um, there, were, there was a little bit of a diverse population. You'll see an arrow here of a black man who was operating a locomotive at a lumber camp. John showed you a, a Chinese person that was at a uh, lumber camp as well. But with, with low numbers of minorities in Coos County, you might think that the Klan would, would not have much of an influence here, but we're going to talk about that. Um, in Coos County, if you did see a person of color, they were probably working in a blue collar job. Uh, Coos County coal was a big industry from the 1860s all the way up through World War I. Coal was, uh, Coos County coal was the only coal uh, really mined in the state. And um, you'll see a picture here showing an Asian person and a, and a, and a black person intermixed with his colleagues. This is also a period where we had Greeks and Italians and Scandinavians and Mexicans. It was quite a diverse population that came to Coos County in the late 1800s. Um, and that population pretty much worked in these um, uh, company towns. This one is a picture of a place called Beaver Hill, which is between Coquille and, and Marshfield at the time. And even though, um, they were working together down in the mine. As, as one author said, down in the mine, racial distinctions became blurred. When they got out of the mine, of course, the racial distinctions were not blurred. Even in a small town like Beaver Hill, those rows you see on the hill were segregated rows. The Italians kept to themselves, the blacks kept to themselves, um, and the Japanese, who were perhaps among the most segregated of all weren't even allowed on that hill 
according to Dow Beckham, who wrote the book Stars in the Dark, the Japanese were actually on a hill uh, where this picture is taken. So they were not even allowed in town. But we did have people uh, of, of diverse backgrounds here. And although they were welcomed because they worked hard, um, they were often underpaid. And of course, you get then uh, arguments you hear even today that um, we hear arguments that Mexican labor is undercutting the uh, wages of uh, white workers. And that argument was, was very strong in Coos County. Um, in 1895, a large number of miners from uh, West Virginia came here. They were promised $5 a day, but when they got here, they were only given 95 cents a day. And they, and they took it for a while and then said, that's even uh, something we can't live on. The community actually raised funds so they could go back to West Virginia. But the threat, the threat in quotes, uh, to the white working class here was that these minority groups would work for low wages and, and would keep wages low. So the original clan I mentioned uh, kind of fa phased out and um, it was never really active. The original clan was never very active at all in Oregon or the South Coast. But around um, uh, 1916, a movie came out that changed things. It was called The Birth of a Nation. Um, here's an advertisement from the Coos Bay Times this film is being showed locally at the Noble Theater. And this movie glorified the Ku Klux Klan era. It made them look heroic. It made them look like the ones that saved the women and children, the Confederate widows and that type of thing. And um, it was a powerful movie. It was one of the first movies to have a chase scene. And it was over two hours in length. It was a, a different kind of silent movie. But um, it led to a group of people back east deciding, let's bring the Klan back. And in, by uh, the end of World War I, the Klan was back. Why? Um, above the picture, above the picture of this march in Washington, D.C., you'll see some of the reasons why. It seems like whenever there's major tension, there's fear. And when there's fear, there's recriminations from those who don't have power. And uh, right at, it, in World War I, um, the communists had just taken over Russia, and there was a huge red scare going on. And the Klan, part of the Klan uh, uh, appeal, you might say, is it was a group that was definitely anti-communist, and they made no bones about them being anti-communist. They were also against this wave of immigrants that had tried to come to the United States because of the conflicts in World War I. You had a lot of people coming over, and that's... That, caused fear and the Klan um, attacked immigration. Prohibition had just been passed in World War I and prohibition was um, a dicey topic. The, the Klan was all for it uh, in name, whether or not they practiced prohibition is another story, but they certainly said that we're gonna uphold this, um, a true American would follow the law. And so they were gonna be for prohibition. They're also for what's called eugenics, there was a movement in the early 20s that talked about um, uh, if you mix the races, you sort of dumb down all the races. And um, it was, it was a, pretty much a, a movement that wound up being uh, adopted by Adolf Hitler, uh, talking about the Aryan race being the superior race. Also women, after World War I, they had worked in the factories and now women were flappers and going to speakeasies and the Klan was not gonna have it. The Klan wanted the women to be in traditional uh, female roles. Uh, the ra radio was coming in, the car was coming in. There was just so much new. It's, it's, in fact, the chapter of the history book I taught in, in the 1920s in World War, in, and just after World War I was often called the new era. You often call it the Roaring Twenties. It roared with tension. So the Klan stepped into all this tension and said, we're going to uh, go back to the America that we uh, think America should be. And we're gonna stand for things that we interpret as being uh, American. The Klan became a very popular organization. Um, and now not in the, just the South, but all over the United States. The man on the upper left-hand corner was named Luther Powell. And he came into Oregon, started at Klamath Falls, worked his way up to Roseburg, Eugene, Salem, and eventually Portland. And he was a, a recruiter. 
<clears throat> he would uh, talk about the benefits of joining the clan. You could join for $10 and he got to keep $4 of it. I put this on here because there was a lot of money to be made uh, by the clan organization. You can see here what, how much Powell would have gotten. There wound up being 43,000 people probably in, involved in the clan. We don't know exactly how many Oregonians were in the clan because it was a secret society. But there was money to be made in memberships, in regalia, uh, and they were very open about it. Joining the clan uh, to us nowadays, I hope, uh, would be an abhorrent thing that would ruin your political career. But it was a fraternal organization in the 20s that seemed to be um, on the right side of patriotism and Americanism. And people openly joined and um, you see a lot of uh, people uh, openly supporting the Klan throughout Oregon. Coos County was not immune to this. Um, David Horowitz, a Klan historian says, Oregonians in general were ripe for recruitment because of a strong identification with the pioneer past. And in Coos County, we had a pioneer past. Um, Patty talked about the treatment of the Indians. Um, we talked about the Oregon Trail and trying to keep the uh, black folk out of the state of Oregon. And um, here's a picture of uh, citizens in Marshfield deporting union activists, the IWW. So uh, there, was, there was a feeling here of, of uh, that there was a pioneer way of life that needed to be upheld and the Klan fit that image. You add that to some very specific economic bad news in Coos County right after World War I. There was a World War I post-war recession and part of it showed up here. You'll see the C.A. Smith Mill, one of the largest lumber mills in the world. Um, it went uh, into receivership at the, t at the time. It wasn't producing like it had uh, two decades earlier. Crews and banks their glory days were over. No one wanted wooden sailing ships anymore after World War I. Uh, metal fuel driven ships were the, were the way of the world. And so that business dwindled. And then the coal mining that um, we talked about earlier was, was done. Coal was done in Coos County uh, after World War I. Nothing was running on steam power anymore. So you take the um, natural Americanism uh, feeling and you throw in bad economic times and you've got the Klan. Now, who's the Klan gonna protest against? Um, like Taylor said earlier, a lot of black people left after the lynchings and, and the segregation that was happening throughout Oregon. Um, there weren't very many Chinese left as John <laughs> suggested with the Exclusion Act, but there were Catholics here. There was a group that wasn't Protestant. And um, even though only about eight and a half percent of Oregonians were Catholic. They were a minority that could be, uh, could be picked upon by the Klan. So that's, that's kind of what the Klan focused on in Oregon, anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-foreigner, anti-communist, if they could find any around here. And I think they thought the IWW, the labor unions would be, be considered communist. Um, there was a Catholic school in Marshfield called St. Monica's. And uh, John has written a wonderful book called um, The Paper Fight. And it talks a lot about the Klan. And in it, he talks about stories of cross burnings that actually occurred in Marshfield uh, at the time. An American flag was nailed over the entrance to this Catholic school. Um, there, was, uh, there were talks of barges floating on the bay with burning crosses. And the idea would be to intimidate and to let people know the Klan was here and yet they were a secret organization that refused to show their face. Taylor mentioned this, uh, Walter Pierce, um, here he is. He was an Eastern Oregon rancher that ran for governor in 1922. And he came to Coos County to the county fair that year to campaign. And when he did, that's what kind of unleashed the Klan in Coos County. Those who wanted to be involved, started to be involved, inspired by Walter Pierce because Walter Pierce was taking platform positions that were clearly in line with the Klan. The Klan was openly supportive of him. And there were cross burnings uh, down in the Coquille area at a place called Lee Valley. Um, there were Italian and Irish Catholics that had crosses burned on their yard. It, it's important to mention this because sometimes we see our history books and 
talking about lynchings and cross burnings in other parts of the country, and we think it never happened here. But um, that's part of what we're doing here tonight is reminding people that these things did happen here. When Walter Pierce came here, um, the Klan was bold enough to take out an ad in the North Bend uh, weekly newspaper. It was called the Coos Bay Harbor, but it was printed in North Bend. Um, Look sharp, Americans. Uh, to ignore the problems of your race and country is to willfully defraud prosperity. So they're linking this movement to economic prosperity. If you can just get rid of these people, you know, these low wage workers we've talked about earlier, um, immigrants that we don't understand, they're somehow dragging down the economy. And um, this ad was openly uh, paid for by the Klan. The biggest thing the Klan tried to do was through the back door intimidate uh, Jews and Catholics uh, when Walter Pierce became the governor, they were bold enough to put forth a bill and pass it called the Oregon School Bill or the Compulsory Education Bill. The idea being this, that if you're truly an American, what problem would you have of requiring every Oregon student, elementary student, to go to a public school? A public school, not a parochial one, not a Catholic school or a Jewish temple school but a public school where you had to learn English and you had to learn history, the Protestant version, apparently. Uh, Scottish Rite Masons were, were definitely um, for this bill. Uh, the only sure foundation for the perpetuation and preservation of our free institutions. Um, and what's important to notice is at the bottom of this uh, handbill is the name of a man named Leslie Johnson. He was a Coos Bay doctor there were 14 people that signed the petition that got before the state legislature to pass this bill and a Marshfield doctor was one of the 14 people behind this and here he is he was making a speech at the uh, Mason's uh, headquarters here in uh, in 1922 at the Eagles Hall. Another person that was for this bill was named Charles Hall. Uh, Charles was a uh, uh, the, the leader of the leading telephone company that established a telephone here between here and California. He was a banker. He was a state legislator, and he was definitely for this bill. And he actually um, ran against another uh, Republican for the nomination for governor, and he was supported by the Klan. He was definitely supported by the Klan. And in John's book about called Paper Fight, um, he got the endorsement of sort of the clan back newspaper here called the Southwest Oregon Daily News. Um, the Coos Bay Times was run by Catholic editors and they were opposed to Mr. Hall. And it was really hard for them because here we have a local person, a Coos Bay Marshfield person, Coos County person, who's on the cusp of being the governor of Oregon and all the benefits that would come from that. But because um, he was clan supported, uh, the Coos Bay Times could not support him and they took a lot of heat for that. There is a building with this man's name on it in downtown Coos Bay. The Hall building is, uh, it was once called the Fitzpatrick building, but Mr. Hall had it built in his day and it, now it's, it's back to being its original name and it still stands in Coos Bay. Um, and this was a man who was closely associated with the Klan. That the bill to ban uh, Catholic and Jewish schools passed uh, by the state. Uh, the state voted 53% to 47. Uh, the Sisters of the Holy Names, a Catholic organization, and some other organizations uh, sued Walter Pierce uh, over this law and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, Pierce versus the Society of Sisters. And before the law could actually take effect in 1926, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously against this Oregon law. What's really important is it just, it's not just important for Oregon history and Coos County history because there were Catholic schools here that would have been affected, but it's really important because this is one of the first cases to take the 14th Amendment, the one that Taylor talked about that Oregon didn't ratify for so long, and it, it took the idea of due process and applied it to this case and that has opened the door for a lot of people that are in the minority to sue for their rights on the due process of the 14th Amendment. 
So I like to th think of this as being maybe the most important Supreme Court case to ever affect the state of Oregon. And it had to do with um, some people that we've been introduced to tonight. The Klan was pretty proud of itself. It could take out ads like this, full page ads in local papers. Once again, this is in the Southwest Oregon Daily News. I've highlighted here a section that says, the Klan believes in justice to all, and for that reason is not anti-Negro, anti-Jew, or anti-Catholic. It just believes in justice to the white man. So I don't know how you can talk out of both sides of your mouth on this, but the Klan's obviously doing that. Then the other part of the uh, box I have here, it talks about what's so important about the uh, school bill. The Klan's pledged to teach true history and will teach patriotism and love of country to millions of young men. Hmm, it didn't into, into, in, into, uh, mention women. That's kind of interesting. Of course, everyone has their own version of what true history is. So um, take it or leave it of what the, what the Klan believed. And... Uh, whether the Klan here in Coos County was a true Klan chapter is up to debate. There was definitely in this ad a provisional Klan, which means maybe they didn't pay all their dues or something and they were unofficial, but there you have it. Um, John's book is tremendous. It is really a, a, a tremendous work about uh, the South Coast and discrimination in general. And I just want to read uh, about four sentences that John wrote at the end of his book that I think speak to what we're trying to do here tonight. And when I use the word clan here, think of any group now that is um, fighting social justice. At first, the clan offered an identity, an organization, action promising to protect the American way of life. Some residents, even in Coos County, joined the clan in the 20s or rode along with it in spirit thinking it was patriotic and an upstanding fraternal organization that promoted American values. But they fell away from the Klan when its more unsavory agenda became apparent. By the end of the 20s, this is not in the quote, but by the end of the 20s, the Klan pretty much had, had dissolved. Intolerance and extremism are a toxic combination, says John, that usually leads to violence. The Klan's presence was a divisive force within the community the Klan and its sympathizers brought into the main, in, brought, bought into the mistaken premise. This is important. They bought into the mistaken premise that in a country as diverse and dynamic as ours, there could be decreed characteristics and behavior that are, are strictly American. The Klan was wrong that there is one universal way, right way to be an American. I think John, these are his words and he nailed it. Um, right on the head, there isn't a, one way to be an American. There's room for a lot of diversity. And I think that's what people here are trying to do. And I think tonight what we're trying to do is just advance the knowledge of history here. We have to admit what's gone on in the past. Um, we certainly hope that those of you who are watching this, if you're stuck at home and you run out of books to read, there are some great books about Oregon history and local history that have a lot to do with it. John's book, you can get on our website. You can go online and order the book and we'll send it to you. Um, there's two books at the top about Native Americans that I've read that are, I think are just excellent. Um, the ones with the maps and the photos, even though it says it's about the Siletz tribe, there's a lot of information there about the Coos and the Coquel Indians in the book called The People Are Dancing Again. Stephen Dow Beckham is a local Marshall graduate that went on to become a tremendous historian, still living. He's written, if you want to see first person accounts, if you want to see what the treaty said and what people said about Indians, you can read his book. The fourth one down is a relatively new book that I think is excellent. It's called Breaking Chains, Slavery on Trial in the Oregon Territory. It covers great depth what Taylor was talking about. It's very well written and it's surprising how blacks were treated in a state that excluded them. Uh, it excluded them, but it, they came and they lived here and some lived here as slaves and it, talk, it openly talks about it. And there are some other clan books as well. So uh, do your reading, educate yourself and, and then we'll move on from there. Thank you, Steve. Um, wow, what an amazing uh, night. I, I truly, as a woman, as a multiracial, woman of color, 
I appreciate hearing the stories about the area that I've lived in since the mid 70s. Uh, I'm so thankful of all of you joining us. We're going to go to our Q&A right now. So Ariel, I'm going to take it from here. If you can uh, just go ahead and read off. And if the panelists want to turn on their video so that people can see us, we can uh, go ahead and do that. So. Awesome. Yeah, there was a lot of really great questions. Um, some of our panelists were kind enough to, to answer during the presentation, but there's still a few I want to make sure get answered live so everyone can hear. Um, the first question is actually going to be for Taylor. Um, and Nancy Lee Stewart asked, are lynching of Native Americans being considered by the Oregon Remembrance Project? So oh, great. Sorry, I tried to answer like the other thing, but I couldn't figure it out. So I was like, I'll just answer at the end. Um, I, thank you. Uh, it's an important question. Um, so I can only speak for myself, uh, which, which is the Oregon Remembrance Project. Um, and I'm, and so my answer is I'm just trying to live out the vision of the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and so I can't speak for them. I can't speak for the Equal Justice Initiative. I can't speak for Brian Stevenson. But if I, if I had to guess, um, I would say that the reason why they didn't include the lynchings of Native Americans, the lynchings of Chinese Americans, the lynchings of Mexicans along the southern border is because they wanted to tell a particular part of a larger story. Um, in April of 2018, they opened up two museums, uh, one, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, or the Lynching Memorial, um, and that might be what you could be familiar with, um, but they also opened up the Legacy Museum, and it, and it chronicles the link between slavery and mass incarceration that we have today, um, drawing a straight line between slavery, lynching, segregation, and now we have, we're living in the era of mass incarceration. And so slavery didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. And so I think that that's the part of the story that they want to tell because we can't understand our present reality today if we don't also take a look at lynching. Um, and we can't understand the way that blacks have been viewed as criminals. Uh, we can't understand the way that blacks have a presumption of dangerousness. Uh, we can't understand the way that black lives haven't mattered in this country. Um, because nothing sustained racial inequality in this country quite like lynching. Um, and so I think that these injustices deserve their own unique story um, because of the different ways that they affected our communities. Uh, but, but that being said, um, I do wish that the Native American community and the Black community had a closer relationship. I think sometimes we get caught up in like, who had it worse? Um, but <laughs> You, you can see the way that the injustices that face the Native Americans and the injustices that face the Af African Americans, they intersect. Um, and so I, I do wish that our, our, our communities had a stronger relationship because I think that would make us better. Um, and I've really been happy to see the way that the Black Lives Matter movement has, has furthered the conversation on the team in Washington should not have that name. <laughs> um, and so I've been glad to see the way that benefit here has benefited over there. Um, and so, you know, the white man's always been trying to keep us apart. Uh, and so I hope, I hope that over the years we can, we can have a closer, more collaborative relationship. And thank you, Taylor. Um, Patty was kind enough to answer almost everyone's questions, I think, um, over the Q&A, but I was hoping that you might expand upon this question. I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, what is the proper or, you know, at least respectful way in which to talk about Native Americans? Somebody asked, why are you saying Indian rather than Native mm -hmm. Americans, tribal or indigenous? Yeah, boy, that is a complicated question because North America is really, really big. And depending on which corner of the continent you're on, different communities definitely have different opinions on that. I use Indian a lot because that's what I grew up with when I was a kid. Um, and it's still a part of our official tribe's name, uh, Confederate tribes of Kuso and Kwesa Isla Indians. Um, when I write, I do try and be a bit more formal. So I will use terms like indigenous or Native American when I'm writing, but there are some, um, some authors who really don't like Native American as a term either for various and sundry reasons. Uh, if I had my druthers, if I had a Harry Potter 
magical wand and could could declare this is the word i would love to steal from canada i i really like the term first nations that has um become kind of the common phrase uh, up north in the last 20 years and i think it would be great if we could borrow that down this way uh, i haven't seen it catch on down this way but perhaps one day it will i don't know but that would be my personal favorite so well thank you for sharing um, a couple quick questions for Steve. Uh, Annis asked, is Dr. Johnson who Johnson Street is named after? Um, John, can you help me on that one? You know more about Marshfield history. I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, you are correct. It is not. I don't, I know some of the streets and there is a uh, legend of street names by Dr. Everett Mingus. Mingus Park comes to mind. Okay. Uh, he was on the committee in 1913 to rename all the streets, which were originally A, B, C, D, E, F, and G on. So, and so they're all named after um, local Marshfield uh, people. Anderson is the first postmaster. Uh, Ferguson, which was originally Flanagan Street, actually, but now it's Ferguson, oh. is a mayor, uh, mayor during the Klan era, Steve. Uh, in okay. The uh, and other Fergusons. I think he was part of the Ferguson transfer family, I think, and so forth. Johnson is a Swedish man who had a large family here. Uh, I don't, I don't know exactly the, 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 uh, but, but no, it isn't, that is not related to Leslie the doctor. Right. By the way, if you look at old pictures of the Coos Bay National Bank, that's the round cornered bank uh, at uh, Central and uh, Second, the one that's uh, being fixed up. Uh, Dr. Johnson had his office upstairs there, and the pictures show his name in gold lettering on the, on the window. Mm. Interesting. Uh, and another question from Mark, Steve, was whatever happened to the letter from the KKK that you used to share in your history <laughs> in high school? So this is a great story. When I was a, a, a second year teacher, I came to North Bend, really wanted to talk about the Klan, so I did. And one of the students said, can I do extra credit? Can I write a letter to the Klan and see uh, what they're up to now? <laughs> and uh, I was a rookie and said, sure, go right ahead. So th this, uh, this young woman wrote to the Klan. And <laughs> Mark remembers this because I used to show it every year after that. The letter that came back was wrapped in tin foil in a handwritten misspelled envelope <laughs> and the letter that was written had a lot of misspellings in it and um it used to the kids would say why would they wrap this in tin foil and it was we, we surmised it's because they felt there was something very secret and what they admitted in the letter was where the headquarters was for the junior clan because they thought they they'd got somebody that was interested in it um, I used it as a way to embarrass the Klan because when we read it together, the misspellings, the punctuation was horrible. And to think that someone would be paranoid enough to wrap a letter in tin foil because the government was somehow looking at our mail, I think made a big impression on how goofy the Klan was. So that's, that's the story that Mark remembers. And Mark, I left it with my, the teacher that took over my room uh, Dustin Hood, he still has the letter. He still shows it. All right. Um, just a couple more. This one is, I think Taylor might have kind of covered in his first uh, response, but it's, it's anonymous, but it says, for any of the presenters that would like to answer, what is your response to community members that don't believe racism is still an issue here in Coos County? I, I think that's a question that we're having across the country, uh, not just in, in Coos County. Um, you know, most important person in our country doesn't believe there's systemic racism, so it's only natural that many of his citizens do as well. Um, and, and my opinion is kind of similar to what I said is, we, you can't look at our history and say, there was no racism. You look at the course of United States history, there was definitely racism. And unless we can point to a point in history and say, that's when it ended, we're still dealing with it today. Slavery didn't end in 65, it just evolved. Um, and so we're dealing with the present day ramifications of 
a country that was founded on genocide, a country that was founded on enslavement. And so it's still relevant today um, in the same way that it was relevant in the past. Uh, go back 50 years and people were still saying, there's no racism here. Um, and so this has been a question that we've talked about forever. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily know what specifically to say to community members that don't see racism um, other than this is why we have history uh, so that we can understand its present day ramifications um, in our present day. And so I think that when you look at the history of our country, you see racism. And so you have to see racism in our present day. I, can I jump in here too? I think I've opened some eyes when I've had some personal talks with folks that ask that question. And what I typically just ask them to do is just reverse the circumstance and put yourself in that position. And you tell me if you're comfortable with that system. Um, if, for example, there was redlining in, in, uh, in Portland and uh, where you, you could, if you're a person of color, you couldn't buy a home. And uh, you'll have people argue, well, that's just because people feel safer in their own neighborhoods. So is that, is, is that systematic racism? Yeah, put yourself in that position. Just reverse it. How would you feel if you were the minority, if you were the white person and you, you, and it was a totally black city and you were told you couldn't live somewhere? I think if people just put themselves in somebody else's shoes and looks at it from that perspective, um, it should open your eyes. All right, thank you. I think that's about wraps it up. If there's anything else you wanted to mention, Marcia, or? Uh, just, uh, just an announcement for our next uh, first Tuesday talk will be August 4th at 6.30 p.m. We have a presentation by uh, one of our volunteers and uh, local uh, people here, Al Solomon, who's going to talk about global change, uh, reason for optimism. Um, and then Steve, next slide. Um, also, just to remind everybody that during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the museum has been closed. So the way that you can help us keep the lights on is to consider renewing your membership or becoming a member of the Coos History Museum. Uh, also, our museum store is now online. So if you want to go to our online store and take a look at the books that we have available, uh, we will get those to you. And also consider making a donation to the Museum COVID-19 Operating Fund, which is helping us uh, uh, during our closure. Uh, just to update those people who are here, we're hoping to reopen the museum. Um, we're just keeping a watch on what's happening here in Coos County, so look for that information soon. And that uh, thank you all so much for coming here. Again, thank you to the sponsors. Uh, Al Pierce uh, company and also the Mill Casino. Thank you to our presenters, our pre panelists. You did a wonderful job. Uh, I will be uh, getting the recording onto our website and uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we have a request to put it in our Facebook. We'll, we'll try to put it on our Facebook page as, as well. Uh, feel free to share it once it's there. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great evening and thank you for joining us tonight. And, and Marsha, I'd just like to say that, go, you know, look at our website, keep up with us because um, there'll be more news about this whole topic of social justice as we go forward. The city of Coos Bay asked us to sort of form a task force to say, where do we go from here? Tonight's um, agenda was to just educate about the past, but we want to now go forward. So keep keep that website in mind. Uh, Ariel does a great job of keeping it up, as well as uh, Becca, one of our staff people, and Marcia.